What's going on here? Well, if you haven't read the Stormlight Archive, in the Stormlight Archive, we do this thing where, um, again, I say we, I do this thing where every book has a flashback sequence. Um, the whole premise is that I started with five characters uh, as kind of my core main cast, and each of them had some mysterious events in their past. Uh, and in each book, I would do a flashback sequence showing how they ended up at the beginning of book one. We are now at book five. The Stormlight Archive is almost finished. Um, and, well, not finished, the first era. There's five more books after that. Um, but the arc of the Stormlight Archive, the original arc that I planned, um, most of, you know, the things that I, I had, had uh, wanted to do in that original way back when, Way of King's Prime, those lasted books one through five. And we are on the fifth of the characters, who is Zeth. And so today, I thought that I would read uh, for you... Um, several of these flashbacks as I'm working on them right now. And let's see. I have to scroll through a whole bunch of other chapters to find them. Um, but what this means is, no, I'm not going to read those to you. They would be super big spoilers. Come on. Um, yeah, I know some of you want them anyway. But, but these are really good to read because if you haven't read the Stormlight Archive, then they aren't spoiling anything, or at least not very much, because they start in the past. So I'm going to read probably for the next uh, 40 minutes-ish, 35 minutes. So I hope you're in for the long haul. And I'm just going to start at, uh, the first Zeth flashback. And we're going to go until we run out of time. Which you know, you guys are like, you can take as much time as you want. Um, but all right. Um, oh, nope, that's not it. That's the wrong chapter. That's a spoiler. Yes, I know. There it is. Zeth son Naturo found magic upon the wind, and so he danced with it. Strict, methodic movements at first, as per the moves he had memorized. He was as the limbs of the oak, rigid but ready. When they shivered in the wind, Zeth thought he could hear their souls seeking to break free, to shed the bark like shells and emerge with new skin, painted by the cool air, yet a flush with joy all the same. Painful and delightful, like all new things. Zeth scraped bare feet across packed earth as he danced, getting it in on his toes, loving the feel of cultivation's embrace. He moved in a wide circle, getting just close enough to the edge to feel, feel feet on grass before dancing back, spinning to the accompaniment of his sister's flute. It almost seemed alive itself, providing him a partner for his dance, wind made alive through sound. The flute was the voice of the air itself. Time became thick when he danced, molasses minutes and syrup seconds, yet he wove, the wind wove among them, visiting each moment to linger before spinning away. He followed it, emulated it, became it. More and more fluid he became, no more rigidity, no more pre-planned steps, sweat flying from his brow to seek the sky. He was the, was the air, churning, spinning, almost violent. Around and around his motions, motions worship for the rock at the center of the patch of ground. For when he was the wind, he felt he could touch that sacred stone, which had never known the hands of men, but which felt the wind each and every day. The stone of his family, the stone of his past, the stone to whom he gave his dance. He came out of the dance finally, panting, drenched in sweat. His sister's music cut off, leaving his only applause the bleeding of the sheep. Molly the ewe had wandered into the circular stone dance track again, and, bless her, she was trying to eat the sacred rock. She had never been the smartest of their flock. Zeth stood, breathing deeply, feeling the sweat stream from his face and pool at his chin, wetting the packed earth below with speckles like stars. You practice too hard, his sister, Elid daughter Naturo, said. Seriously, Zeth, can't you just relax once in a while? He looked to her as she stood up from her seat at the, on, in the grass and stretched. Elid, at 14, was three years older than he was. Like him, she was on the shorter side, though she was squat where he was spindly. Trunk and branch, Doc Sundalk called them. 
which was kind of appropriate, even if both dogs were idiots. She wore orange as her splash, the vivid piece of colorful clothing that marked their station. A bright orange apron, in her case, across the gray dress and vibrant white underground that poked through to cover forearms and collar. She spun her flute in her fingers, uncaring, like she hadn't broken her previous one doing just that. Zeth bowed his head and walked over to get some water from the barrel. Rainwater had filled with pure rainwater had filled it with pure clean water, not a speck of dirt. He enjoyed looking through that, all the way down to the wooden bottom. He liked seeing things that couldn't be seen, like air and water, things that were there yet not, all at once. Why do you practice so hard? Elid said. There's nobody here but the sheep. Molly likes my dancing, Zeth said softly. Molly is blind, Elid said. She's licking the dirt right now. Molly likes to try new things, he said, smiling and looking toward the old you. Whatever, Elid said, flopping back on the grass. Wish there was more to do out here. Dancing is something to do, he said. The flute is something to do. We must learn to add so that... She threw a dirt clod at him. He dodged easily, his feet light on the ground. He might only be 11, but some in the village whispered he was the best dancer among them. He didn't care so much about that. He only cared about doing it right. If he did it wrong, then he still had to practice. Elid didn't think that way. It bothered him how blasé she was about her practicing. She didn't like talking to him about it. She th- seemed like a different person these days. Zest shook his head and tied back on his splash, a red handkerchief he wore around his neck, then went on to count the sheep. A few minutes later, he, when he walked past Elid on his way to count the ones on the other side of her, she was still laying and staring at the sky. Do you believe, she said, the stories they tell about the lands on the other side of the mountains? The lands of the stonewalkers, he said. Why wouldn't I? 37, 38, where's Swallow? They just sound so outlandish. Elid, listen to the words you say. Of course stary- stories about an- outlanders sound outlandish. There she is, 39. But really, Zeth, she said, lands where everyone walks on stone? Like, what do they do? Pick them out in the ground and hop only from stone to stone, avoiding the stoil? Zeth glanced at the family stone. It peeked up from the earth like cultivation's own eyeball, staring at the sky, unblinking. Six feet across, but maybe with, uh, with half more of it buried, it was a vibrant red orange, a splash for Roshar, like the one he wore. He'd chosen his color deliberately. I think, he said to her, that there must be a lot more rock out there. I think it's hard to walk without walking on stone. That's why they get desensitized to it. But where do the plants grow then, she asked. Everyone always talks about how the outside is full of dangerous plants that try to eat people. It's all anyone ever whispers about, so there must be soil. True, unless all these plants were like moss, or all those plants were like moss, He had trouble imagining fluffy curls of moss being dangerous, though. Maybe the terrible vines he'd heard about grew from patches of soil, but stretched out long, like tentacles. Like the things that lived in the tidal pools a short distance down the coast. I heard, she said, they constantly kill people out there, that nobody adds, they only subtract. Ah, who makes the food then, he said. They must eat each other, she replied. Or maybe they're just always starving. You know how those ones on the coast are? Those ones. He looked nervously into the distance, though you could only see the ocean on the clearest days. His home of Claremont was at the very edge of a broad plain, excellent for grazing, with the ocean beyond, on the southeastern side of Shinovar. An honored location, near one of the monasteries, just further along the ridge. In Zas' estimation, it was the perfect place to live. You could both see the mountains and visit the ocean. You could walk for days across the vibrant green prairie, and there was never lack of grazing land for sheep. He bent down next to old Molly, scratching at the ears as she rubbed her head against him. She might lick rocks and eat dirt, but she was also good for a hug. He loved her warmth, the scratchy wool on his cheek, the way she always stayed nearby to keep him company, even when the others wandered. She bleated softly as he finished hugging her, then wiped the salty, dried sweat from his head. Maybe he shouldn't practice so hard, but he knew he'd forgotten a few steps and gotten them wrong. And he'd stumbled a few times. Their father said that they were blessed in their lives as people, could add beneath, as people who could add beneath the farmer's eyes. Just the right station in life, 
not required to toil in the field, not forced to kill and subtract, allowed to tend sheep and develop their talents. Free time was the greatest blessing in the world. Maybe that was why men of, the men of the ocean sought to kill them and steal their sheep. If you lived your life out in the lands where everyone walked on stones, your morals must wither and you sought only to take. It must make them angry to see such a perfect place, full of people with time. The terrible men from the oceans couldn't have had that time themselves, or couldn't have that time themselves. So like any petulant child, they simply destroyed it where they saw it. Do you think, Elid whispered, that the servant of the monastery will, will ever come out and fight for us? Do you think any of them will bring their swords to one of the raids and drive off those terrible men? Elid, he said standing, the servants of the monasteries would never subtract. I think you're wrong, she replied. Mother says they practice with their weapons in there. Why practice with them except to? They will fight the void bringers when they arrive, Zest snapped. That is the reason, no other. He glanced toward the ocean, unreasonably worried that one of the strange raiders would hear. Don't speak of it. Nobody must know. If the outlanders realize the treasures of the monasteries. Ha, huh, she said. I'd like to see the awful ones raid the monastery and face down one of the servants. You know that some of them can fly. They... Don't speak of it, he said, not in the open. Elid rolled her eyes at him, still lying on the grass. What had she done with her flute? If she lost another and father had to carve one for her again. She hated when he brought that up as well, so he forced himself to stay quiet. He pulled back from Molly and then looked down at the ground she'd been licking to find another rock. He stumbled back, part shocked, part terrified. This was a small one compared to their other rock, only a hand span wide. It peeked up from the earth, perhaps revealed in last night's regular rain. Zeph put his finger to his lips, backing away. Had he stepped on that while dancing? It was in the packed earth of the dancing ring right around the stone, directly in his path. What, what should he do? This was the first stone he'd ever seen emerge. Even the ones in other villages and fields, carefully marked off and properly revered, had been there for years. A new stone. Was it a sign? What's up with you, Elid said. Molly, step on your toe or something? He couldn't speak, so he simply gestured. She, perhaps, perhaps sensing his level of concern, rose and walked over. As soon as she saw it, she gasped. They shared a look. I'll go fetch mother and father, Zeth said, then started running. Flashback two. Zeth's father, Naturo, knelt beside the stone. His mother, Zenid, was in the town overseeing painting classes, so they'd sent a messenger to her via tech, one of their courier parrots. Zeth wasn't certain what frightened him so much about finding a new rock. He danced around the other one daily. He loved their rock, and a new one was cause for celebration, surely? Except he wished it hadn't happened to him finding it. Something new meant possible celebration, possible attention, possible change. He wanted things to remain calm, Quiet days full of languid breezes and gathering sheep. Nights spent beside fireplace or candles, listening to mother tell stories. He didn't want excitement or some grand new thing. Too much of a chance that it would upset what he already loved. What do we do, father? Elid said. Do we call the stone shamans? It depends, he said. It depends. Their father was a calm man with a long beard. He liked to keep tied with a green ribbon at the bottom. Head shaded by his customary tall reed hat with a wide brim. He was a, had a good-natured paunch that spoke to his skill and talent as a cook. He had all the answers, always. Depends, Zest said, stepping up beside him, half hiding behind his father's bulky form and peeking out at the little stone. Depends on what? We just do what is right, don't we? Father glanced at their larger stone than at this one. A single rock is a blessed anomaly. Uh, anomaly. Two might mean more, might mean the Spren have chosen this region. Wait, Elid said, hands on hips. What do you mean? I mean, Father said, there might be others hiding beneath the surface here. Unlikely, but possible. Stone shamans will want to take the entire region, set it off, preserve it, and watch for a few years at least, see if anything else emerges. And us? Zeth asked. Well, we'd have to move, Father replied. Tear down the house, just in case it's accidentally on holy ground. Set up somewhere else, wherever the farmer finds lands for us. Maybe in the town. In the town? Zeth turned, looking to the distance. Though the nature of the rolling hills prevented him from seeing the town unless he climbed up on top. 
It was close enough to walk in an hour or so. He liked it that far away. He found the place noisy, congested, smelly. In the town, it felt like the mountains weren't right around the corner because the buildings blocked them out. It felt like the meadows had gone brown, replaced by dull road roadways. It felt like the ocean was far off because you couldn't smell the breeze coming off the water any longer. He didn't hate the town, but he got the sense that it hated the things that he loved. I don't want to move, Elid said. We did something great. We found a rock. We shouldn't be punished. If it's right, Zeth said, then we just have to do it, though. Right, Father? Father was silent. He stood up, pulling at his trousers, and waited. Soon, Zeth picked out someone hurrying along the path between hills toward their home. Single women, woman, wearing a long green skirt as their splash, an audacious amount of color for their station. Wide apron over the front, curly light brown hair that bunched up around her head like a cloud. She was carrying a wooden shovel. Zeth gasped, jaw dropping. That couldn't mean. She hurried up to them, shovel over her shoulder. Father nodded toward the new rock, and mother let out a relieved sigh. So small? You had me worried with that message, Naturo. Mother, Zeth said. What are you doing? Just a quick relocation, she said. We'll dig up the rock, haul it off a few hundred yards, then place it in the soil there. Let it rain a little so it seems to have naturally poked up, then tell everyone about it. Zeth gasped. We can't touch it. Mother pulled out a pair of gloves from her pocket. Of course not. That's why I brought gloves, dear. That's the same thing, Zeth said, horrified. He looked to his father. We can't do this, can we? Father scratched at his beard. Depends, I suppose, on what you think, son. Me? You found the rock, father said, looking to mother, who nodded in agreement. So you can decide. I pick what's right, Zeth said immediately. Is it right for us to lose our home? Father asked. I... Zeth pulled back, glancing at the house. There might be dozens of rocks down there. But in the hundred... One has emerged, so it's unlikely. Moving the stone a few hundred yards will make the shamans watch this region, but without the rocks being so close together, their worry will be mostly nebulous. But then again, we'd have to move it in secret. We're supposed to reverence stone, treat it as the home of the spren. That's why you dance to it. We hate the stonewalkers on the outside, Zeth said, because of how they treat it, treat it. Father knelt down, one hand on Zeth's shoulders. We don't hate them. They're just people who don't know the right way of things. They raid us, Father, Elid said, arms folded. That's not just them being confused. Yes, well, maybe those ones are our evil. But it's not because they live in a place, place with too much stone. It's because of the choices they've made. He looked at Zeth and nodded his head, his spirit juggling like it did when he laughed. It's okay, son. You can choose what you want. If you want us to go, turn this in now, well... Zeth asked. No, I don't think that I can. Unfair to put you with that. We can move the rock or move our home. I'll accept either one. Maybe we should let him sleep on it, Mother said. No, Zeth said. No, we can move it. All three of them relaxed as he said it, and he felt a sudden shameful, shameful resentment. His father said he could choose, but they'd all three clearly wanted a specific decision. He'd made it, he felt, not because it was right, but because they wanted it. But how could the, all three of them want it if it wasn't right? Maybe Zeth was just broken in some way. He couldn't see what they did. Maybe it was all right to just be lax about all of this. He still hated the entire situation. If they'd just told him what they intended to do and then done it, that would have been fine. Why, but why give him the choice? Didn't that see it made it him, his fault, what they were doing? Let me dig about it, Mother said, putting on her gloves. Looks small, but that can be deceiving. Wouldn't want to find out that it's secretly as big as a house down there. They all stepped back, and Mother started digging. Zeth winced every time the shovel scraped the stone. That was not a natural sound. He hoped they would indeed discover the rock was enormous, so the pla plan had to be abandoned. But in the end, it was really just kind of small, a foot across at the widest. He could have held it in one hand if he'd wanted. No. Don't think like that, he told himself, putting his hand down to the side. Molly the ewe, seeming to have sensed his tension, rubbed up against him, and he felt at her wool, her warmth, hoping to draw strength from it. Even, even Mother seemed a little unsure now that she dug the rock out. She stepped back, 
leaving it at the hole. She hadn't touched it at all. You scraped it, Elid said. That seems kind of obvious to, to the sight. Once we've buried it again, Mother said, nobody will see those scrapes. How much trouble would we be in, Elid asked, if someone finds out what we did? I suspect the farmer wouldn't be happy, Father said. He laughed then, and it seemed genuine. Might require some cake to make up for it. Don't look like that, Zeth. We'll show devotion because we choose to. And so, or, we show devotion because we choose to. And so, the kind of devotion is ours to decide. I don't understand, he said. Don't the stone shamans tell us what to do? They tell us the teachings of the spren, Mother said. She shoveled, shoveled, shouldered her shovel. But we choose to interpret those teachings. What we're doing today is reverent. Enough for me, at least. Zeth thought about that for a moment and wondered, as this was not the first clue in his life, but it might be the most stark one, if this was the reason, perhaps, they chose to live outside of town. Every other shepherd family lived inside the buildings there, beneath the shadow of the monastery. He'd gone with his family each month for devotion since he could remember. He didn't dare think that his family wasn't faithful, yet the older he got, the more he had questions like these. It was only today, however, that he'd really had to confront the fact. What did he feel about his parents doing something he knew the shamans wouldn't approve of? They were still all standing there, staring at the rock, when the horn sounded. Father looked up, then whispered a soft prayer to the spren of their stone. The horns meant raiders on the coast, coming in from the east in the lands of the stonewalkers. Zeth felt an immediate panic. What do we do? Gather the sheep, Father said. Quickly, we must drive them toward Dyson's Valley near, the, near town. The farmer's troops in the region will be safe if we move inland. But this, Zeth said, gesturing at the rock, this! Mother, suddenly seeming determined, just reached down and grabbed the rock in two gloved hands. Together, all four of them froze, then looked toward their family stone. It sat there, unblinking, unmoving. None of them were struck down. And Zeth thought he could tell from the way his parents relaxed after a moment that they hadn't been certain what would happen either. At least it seemed they hadn't been secretly moving rocks around all his life. This was a new experience for them. Mother walked over to a nearby tree, then carefully placed the stone in a gnarled nook, gnarled nook near the roots. Then she hid it with a handful of leaves. That will do for now, she said. If raiders do come to the home, they'll think nothing of a stone. They don't feel or commune with them. They ignore the spren. Father and Elid went to start gathering the sheep. Zeth just held Molly, who bleated softly while he wished that this day had never begun. Mmm. And just so that there's something a little bit new, I am going to go ahead and read one more chapter. I just have to scroll through some other chapters full of spoilers before we get to it. Boo. You'll get to read them eventually. When? Yes, November 2024. Assuming I'm on the ball. All right. Here we go. Zeth felt that somehow he was in the shadow of the mountains even after, long after the sun had gone down. The bleeding of lambs filled the air, each call jostling one another, emerging from the darkness around him, with a nervous energy reminiscent of a slaughter. Dozens of shepherd families crowded in this ravine, homes left behind as they were too close to the coast, too near to the ra ravaging Stonewalker raiders and their dark ships. Zeth and his sister had to work hard to keep their flock, driven hastily through the oncoming dusk, from bleeding into the others. It wasn't impossible to sort flocks that intermingled. Indeed, it might be inevitable, considering how shepherds and their families kept pulling further and further back, up against the slope of the mountains, nervously pushing to be as far from those raiders as possible, inching as close as they dared to the place that soil gave way to the stones. These mountains were holy too, but not so much as the ones that emerged from below. The mountains were a fortification against the outside, a wall to hold out the strange people of the other world. They weren't an object of worship so much as a beautiful sign that the spren loved the shin. Zeth and Elid eventually got their sheep into a huddle, separated enough from the others. The beasts wouldn't sleep easily tonight. They could sense the concern of their masters. Or maybe they sensed more. He looked to the sky and the surrounding clouds covering over moon and star. The night felt oppressive to him. Lanterns made points of light all through the valley below, but they almost seemed to be swimming in that blackness, like they were stars, and he was somehow floating above them. 
He left his sister to count the sheep and found his mother beside some improvised fire pits, discussing an evening meal to hopefully calm everyone down. Lentil soup. No meat, of course. They weren't soldiers. She put Zat the work, which is what he realized he'd wanted in, to do in wandering this direction. Gone and buried was his desire for some, sim some simple time to express himself. He needed to sweat to work out his nervousness, and standing around with the sheep wouldn't have let him accomplish that. So he mashed, mashed vegetables with vigor. No chopping. The farmer owned several knives of fine steel, crafted using metals that had been made using mythical powers from the east, so no stone had touched them in their forging, but none were available. So you used your mortar and pestle, crushing the onion, garlic, and carrots together, each of which had been lightly braised to soften them. This went into the large clay uh, bowl, basin, and you repeated with some more. Good, thick work. In the distant darkness, music started playing as someone got out their flute. This cut off shortly, leaving the air to the nervous bleeding. The farmer wouldn't want to give away their position in the night in case raiders slipped past his soldiers. Zeth, Zeth had heard this was the reason for no bonfires and minimal lanterns. Indeed, he worked at his mashing only by the shadowy light of the fire pit, which had been dug into the ground. Zeth enjoyed working on soups like this, even if the onions made his eyes water. The cook, who oversaw the feeding of the people on the lands and made certain nobody went hungry, had creating, created these interesting wooden ladles for measuring. His current one, on the, uh, one had the bowl of the ladle split into three sections with some smaller measuring sections along the handle. All he had to do was fill up the largest of the compartments with carrot, the middle one with onion, and the next one with garlic. Then he filled in the little divots on the handle with salt, ground pepper, and thyme, respectively. He could dump that all into his pestle and begin mashing and would always have the right proportions. Once that was done, he added it to the basin one, with one scoop of lentils and two of water. With the measuring ladle, he could work without supervision, filling the, the basin on his own, never worrying about his measurements or being forced to try to tell if the soup tasted right. Despite the late hour, he didn't feel tired. He was too nervous for that, but continued glad for the work. He enjoyed it specifically because it was almost impossible to do it wrong. Why couldn't more things in life have a tool like this for exact measuring? He hadn't forgotten about the choice his family had made in moving the stone. And unfortunately, now that he had time to think about it, he found himself increasingly uncomfortable. Not just about what they'd done, but that all three other members of his family would have agreed to it so quickly without apparent concern. Why was he so different? Fretting over this brought him little satisfaction, though he did finish an entire, uh, an entire basin of stew. He left it simmering and moved to another, though the cook s herself soon strode past and checked on his work. If she had arrived in person, that, um, that said something about the level of the disturbance. The girthy woman was dressed all in color, with a red skirt, blue sh sash, and yellow blouse. Dark, curly hair up and twin buns on her head. Skirt parted at the front to show off another splash of yellow underneath. She was one of those who added, a ruling counterpart to the farmer of the region. Needs more pemper, she declared of the stew he'd left behind. What? No, he'd done it perfectly. Zeth watched with horror as she added some pepper, then bustled off, calling for a group of shepherds to come in and get bowls in a rotation. Why? Why would she say that? She'd created the measuring tool herself. If he followed that, then the soup should taste right. It shouldn't need to be changed in any way. Unless he must have done something wrong. Why couldn't he get things right even if he had the tools? He tried to get back to his work after this, but was distracted as another vibrantly dressed figure stepped up to the fire. The farmer was dressed in his robes. He wouldn't work in those, but wore them over his traditional farming clothing, which would be soiled from his day's activity. The dirty clothing was a symbol, but so were the colors he bore, and so it was best for him to both not change and change at the same time. In this case, a violent outer robe and an inner sky blue one of a filmier material no mere splash of color for the farmer. He was color. The farmer was he who added. He had pale skin like Zeth's family. Not exactly uncommon in this region, though those of darker skin were more prevalent. Ah, he said, seeing Zeth. Son Naturo, I had hoped to find your father here at the fire. I'll find him for you, colors, Nimi, Zeth's mother said from the darkness nearby, where she'd been distributing bowls to those who'd come to eat. The farmer bowed his head and spread his hands, indicating he'd accept her offer of service as one should always try to do. Then he accepted a bowl of food from the cook as she bustled the other direction. Zeth guessed he'd have refused that if others had been unfed, if she hadn't done it herself. But one did not contradict the cook when she delivered food. 
The farmer settled down then, robes rustling, on a log near Zeph, who continued working on the large basin of stew. The man's presence made Zeph uncomfortable. Was he supposed to say something, entertain the man? Zeph began sweating despite the cool night air. I have heard from your father about you, son Naturo, the farmer said, that you are becoming an excellent dancer. Perhaps you could dance for my workers and I in the field sometime. I, I don't know colors, Nimi, Zeph said, blushing in the night. Entertaining the farmers is usually a job for the musicians, isn't it? It's a job for any who wishes it, the farmer said. Does it add, though, Zeph asked. Dancing doesn't make anything or feed anyone. Ah, you are so young yet, he said. If you think that to sweeten a person's life and make the hours pass is not a form of feeding them. The farmer smiled. The man had a kindly face, oval, like a grain of wheat topped by flaxen hair. His hands were calloused with dirt under the nails, a true sign of nobility. Colors, Nimi? Zeth found himself asking. How do you know what to do? I'm not sure that I follow you, child. How do you know what is right? Zeth said. The right choices to make. How do you decide what they are? The farmer sat for a time, stirring his food, taking a bite now and then. Do you know the difference between men and animals, son Naturo? He asked softly. Zeth frowned, but couldn't find words. It seemed like a question with a great number of possible answers, and he didn't want to say the wrong one. Men, the farmer said, can take actions. Animals take actions, colors Nimi, Zeth said. It may seem that they do, yes, but if you consider, you will realize they do not. When does the rain, does the rain act when it falls? Does the rock act when it rolls down the hill? No, the spren move these things. They cannot act, they cannot choose. Zeth thought. Was the farmer testing him? Because his own experience taught him otherwise. Yes, it must be a test. I have a sheep, Zeth said, Molly. She always comes close to me when I'm sad and licks my face. She chooses colors near me. Does she now, the farmer said, sounding amused. I think not, but I suppose it is wisdom after a fashion to think your own thoughts, son Naturo. Maybe it wasn't a test. Well, regardless, the farmer said, acting, choosing. This is what defines us. And so, you ask what I know what to do? I don't. That is the simple answer. I try, I see, I act. The spren mo move most things in the world, child, but not us. There's a reason in that, one that the stone shamans teach, and one I ponder as I work. So I must learn what to do? By trying, the farmer said. That's not specific enough, Zeth said, smashing ves vegetables in his pedestal with vigor. Two people could try and come up with different answers. Surely the spren have the truth for us. Surely if we ask, they will tell us what to do. If they did, the farmer said, would that not simply be the same as moving us? Making of us rain or rocks or other things that did not move on their own? He'd been about to say sheep, Zeth thought. As the farmer finished the last of his soup, then glad up toward the sky, the darkness vaguely broken by the peaks of the mountains. In other lands, rulers don't act, he said. They decide, but don't act. That is why I must go each day to bring life from the earth, why I must add rather than subtract. That part made sense, but still, Zeth found that his conversation had yielded fewer answers than he'd hoped. If the farmer didn't know the right thing to do, then what hope did Zeth have? Perhaps, he thought, I can find the spren and asked them. They lived inside of everything, but were coy, emerging only at very special times. Zeth had only seen a spren three times in his life that he could remember, and each glimpse had been fleeting over before he could really do more than stare in shock. The, father stood up as nearby, the farmer stood up as nearby as Zeth's father arrived in the, at the dim fireside. Check your mixing tool, son Naturo, farmer said. You've been adding too much pepper to the soup. He walked over and joined Zeth's father, speaking to him softly while washing his bowl at the cleaning trough. Zeth Fish finished his current um, basin of soup, then got a bowl for himself and one for his sister. He hiked off, hiked off through the darkness again, up to the armpit of the valley, where she was, was set up and looking pensive, sitting on the grass, her small ceramic lap in her, lamp in her lap. She looked up as soon as he arrived, walking to him eagerly. Was she that hungry? Zeth, she whis whispered, we're missing three sheep. We'll find them in the morning, he said, handing her a bowl, probably with one of the other flocks. She nodded, and by the flickering light, glanced at him, then at the food, then in a way, then away. Nervous. What? he demanded. Molly is one of the missing sheep, she said. I know how you favor her, Zeth. It's all right, though. I'm sure she's just with one of the other flocks. 
He frowned. Molly did not like other sheep. She was almost blind, yes, but she could smell them. You're sure, he asked, she's not here? No, do you remember bringing her? I gathered her to the herd before we struck out, he said, but, I mean, there was so much chaos. He met his sister's eyes, then turned to the southwest, toward the ocean in their home. A red haze stained the air in that direction. The Stonewalker Raiders, they liked to attack at night. Their metal lanterns were more effective than the ceramic ones the Shin used, and their powerful bows could set the roofs of fishing villages ablaze. The farmer brought in soldiers, he thought, of our own. They'll be defending the coastlands. Lands. It was highly unlikely any stonewalkers would strike in as far as Zeph's family homestead. I'll just, he said, go check some of the other nearby flocks. She's easy to spot. He lit himself a lantern and sheltered it with, with a covering, then went searching. But as he worked, calling to nearby shepherds and asking after missing sheep, a feeling of dread built inside of him. Molly always found her way home. He wasn't certain how she did it, but she was the one he didn't need to worry about when the flock strayed. She always came home. And so, after searching five of their flocks, Zeth found himself again gazing to the southwest toward that blazing horizon. Perhaps it was his conversation with the farmer, emphasizing that the defining feature of human beings was their ability to choose. Perhaps it was the way his family had done what they had earlier in digging out the rock. Perhaps it was the general air and tone of the day, whispering that there were, there were no right answer, just decisions to be made. But in that moment, Jeff, Zeth made his decision. A wholly uncharacteristic one he likely wouldn't have made on any other night, even facing the same dire circumstances. He put out his lamp, trusting on the filtered moonlight breaking through the crowds, clouds. They went stalking into the night toward their homestead to find Molly by himself. Mm. Well, and there you are. I'm sorry to make you wait two years to find out what happens to Zeth. Um, maybe I'll try to do another reading next year at Dragonsteel to get us a little bit further along. Um, I am currently approaching 80,000 words in the book, which would be a lot of words for a normal book, but these are 450,000 words long. Um, and so um, I am going to work on it uh, quite assiduously through the next year. I have very little else to distract me, and so my goal is to finish this by January 1st. Um, not this January 1st, the next one. I'm fast, but I'm not that fast. Um, I want to give a hearty thanks to all of you who came to Dragonstill 2022. This has been quite the amazing experience. Thank you all so much for your support. I'm going to go meet around 300 of you now that, uh, that got the lottery to meet me. Um, I'm sorry that I can't meet all of you. There are way too many of you. I sign about 75 books in an hour, and so if I had to do uh, 5,000 of you, uh, you can do the math. But uh, hopefully we'll, I'll get to meet all of you at different occasions. Once again, enjoy the Lost Medal, and thank you so very much.